Hello, and welcome to another edition of Segway, the show that allows us to talk about issues and ideas here on the campus of Southern Illinois University Edwardsville. I'm Kevin Leonard, the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, and I'm very pleased to be here today with Dr. Julie Zimmerman, Professor and Chair in the Department of Anthropology, and Dr. Gregory Fields, Distinguished Research Professor in the Department of Philosophy. Dr. Zimmerman earned her bachelor's degree in anthropology from Washington University in St. Louis in 1990. She then attended New York University, where she earned a Master of Arts degree in anthropology in 1994, a Master of Philosophy in anthropology, and her Ph.D. in 2000. Dr. Fields received his bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of Utah in 1982, a master's degree in philosophy of education from Goddard College in 1984, a master's in philosophy from the University of New Mexico in 1990, and his Ph.D. from the University of Hawaii in 1994. Both are also faculty members in the CAS Native American Studies program, and they were important participants in the development of SIUE's land acknowledgement statement, which we will discuss in greater detail later. Welcome to Segway, Dr. Zimmerman and Dr. Fields. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Well, let's begin by having you each tell our audience a little bit about yourself. So let's start with you, Dr. Zimmerman. Let's start, uh, let's, uh, <clears throat> how did you become interested in anthropology? Uh, well, stop me if you've heard this one before, but I'm a native of Barnhart, Missouri, and I'm the youngest of five kids. My dad was a sheet metal worker, so I'm a first-generation college student. And um, I won the scholarship to Wash U, and uh, I was looking through the course listings, and A, anthropology was the first thing in the book. And that was where all the cool stuff was, and I thought, wow, this is everything I've ever been interested in. And so I went to Wash U and studied anthropology. Uh, I loved cultural anthropology, but I went on my first excavation uh, when I was 18, and um, that's how I decided to become an archaeologist. Oh, wow. That's a, that's a great story. I, I especially like the fact that, that it starts with, with the letter A, so <laughs> the fact that it's first in the catalog. And Dr. Fields, how did you become interested in philosophy? Well, my father's father was an itinerant ranch worker, what we used to call a cowboy, and my grandma was a cook for the, the cowboys up in, in Montana. And my dad, as a kid, born in 1915, over 100 years ago, was around Indian people and really interested in the culture and respectful of it. And that was something he, he passed on to his children. We're all interested in um, American Indian culture and thought. And that family moved, following the ranch work, down into Wyoming. And uh, that, of course, is uh, Wind River Shoshone country. And there again, my dad learned about the Indian people there. And then on into Salt Lake City. And, and Salt Lake, of course, was one of the relocation cities where a lot of urban Indian people moved uh, in the mid 20th century. And so through my father, I got interested in the Indian uh, worldview and the way of seeing our, our natural world and the world of the spirit and the hum human community uh, in a, a respectful way, in a sacred way. And myself, I grew up after uh, my birth in Salt Lake City, our family moved to the Hawaiian Islands just shortly after that Hawaii had become a state. Uh, in the early 60s. Uh, it was through a family military assignment. And there I was exposed as a child to many uh, Polynesian cultures, Asian cultures, European cultures. And this has remained an interest of mine since I was five years old. Um, our human nature, our, um, the universality, and the differences among cultures. And so I, I finished uh, some early education in different parts of the country and ended up in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where I studied philosophy. And I was working in Asian philosophy primarily, uh, philosophies of India. And uh, of course, Albuquerque has a lot of American Indian culture, and the university is a good place to uh, learn about American Indian thought and culture, both historical and contemporary. And I wanted to study American Indian philosophy, but philosophy as a discipline doesn't too much uh, yet recognize indigenous philosophies, which are not text-based, but oral and lived tradition. Mm -hmm. And so I stayed with my uh, Hindu and Buddhist philosophy, and I returned to Hawaii, my childhood homeland, 
uh, in my late 20s to get a PhD in comparative philosophy at the University of Hawaii. And I specialized in the philosophies of India. I wrote about healing traditions, including um, the medical tradition of Ayurvedic medicine. And I was very interested in the relationship between uh, medicine and spirituality, healing and our spiritual life. And we had a conference in 1992. I'm coming to the end of my long bio here. Uh, <laughs> it was called 500 Years After Columbus. Mm -hmm. And there, we had some Northwest Coast uh, culture bearers, one of whom was Mr. Johnny Moses of the New Chanoth and Coast Salish. And I'd read about him before, and I thought, what a beautiful philosophy, you know, a way of mm -hmm. learning how to, um, you know, when you learn to treat and see the, the natural world and other human beings as sacred, and then you learn to uh, see and treat yourself as sacred. And I thought that was so important in our world that is so torn by um, so many kinds of division and suffering. And so I went on to, uh, to work in American Indian philosophy here at SIUE along with my work in Asian philosophy. And um, so I've done both of those, but I really found a place in American Indian studies, uh, especially as a philosopher. Um, where I decided on philosophy was in Vermont in uh, graduate school. I was reading the Tao Te Ching, and I thought, what a wonderful text that embraces and expresses so much uh, wisdom and depth in just a few short words. And as it happened, Chinese philosophy and language didn't quite uh, work out for my logical mind, and I went with uh, Sanskrit and the Indian studies. <laughs> but what a great background, um, India, to learn about uh, traditions of knowledge and diverse cultures. So I've been working in American Indian philosophy and studies um, really since my first project at SIUE in 1996, which I'm finishing up this summer. It's a long project. <laughs> I'll talk about that later. Thank you for listening. Right. <clears throat> well, thank you. Uh, that sounds absolutely fascinating. So, so I'd like to, to ask each of you to tell us a little bit more about your scholarly research. So, uh, Dr. Zimmerman, why don't you tell us what you're, what you're working on now and what you're, how that fits into your larger uh, research goals? So um, my, I'm an archaeologist who works in this area, and as you know, we are 20 minutes from the largest archaeological site north of Mexico, uh, Cahokia, which was a great Native American city about 1,000 years ago. And um, I wrote a paper in 2009, I think I've talked about in this program before, about Cahokia as a theater state, and um, that with the idea that it's dramatic rituals that are bringing, uh, you know, because Cahokia was built by immigrants. The, it's, there it was a multi-ethnic Native American city, multiple tribes coming there to build it. And I think what was bringing them was the dramatic r rituals. They came to Cahokia to help build it because they wanted to be part of this amazing social experiment. So. Um, in teaching Native American studies, um, I became more interested in the storytelling aspect of those rituals. Um, so let me back up and say that uh, Greg, I think about 2008 or something, brought Pauline Hilaire yeah. to the mm -hmm. SAUE campus, and I, he was she uh, was of, of the Lummi tribe, correct, yeah. Coast Salish, mm -hmm. and uh, she was uh, Greg had her over at the dome. She was this, like, I'm going to say 80-year-old little old lady, reminding me of both of my grandmothers at the same time, mm -hmm. telling stories and singing songs. Uh, you've got her on the front of your, I see, on your CD right there. Yes. Uh, Dr. Leonard. Anyway, so she was a wonderful woman, wonderful storyteller, and she was talking about their uh, American Indian Center at whatever university she was affiliated with. And I Evergreen sat College. Thank you. <laughs> and I sat there and I thought, why aren't we doing this? Because we had faculty in multiple departments who... Uh, we're working in Native American studies. I thought we, sh we should be doing this. So uh, we created the minor in Native American studies at that time. I think it, official, it became official in 2010 by the time all the paperwork is, was approved. And um, a few years after that, I found myself teaching the introduction to Native American studies. And let me say, WashU, when I was there uh, as an undergrad, did not have any Native American studies. Today they have the, Ka the Catherine Booter Center, which is dedicated to Native American social work. But back then, there wasn't any such thing. Uh, at NYU, I took one class with Karen Blue, who uh, worked in, among Southeastern Native Americans. So really, uh, you know, my, my deeper understanding of, of living Native American cultures 
uh, really uh, took root and flourished teaching the introduction to Native American studies here. And um, having the students read stories and talk about the context of storytelling really, you know, began to click about how important that was in, uh, you know, as we are, all humans are storytellers. I think that is mm -hmm. what makes us human. And, um, and, and certainly the, the oral tradition is, is one of our stereotypes of Native American culture, right? But it's true. Oral tradition is absolutely critical to Native American culture. And so my current research focuses on it, uh, the, what kind of stories that they would have been telling at Kokia of the, all the rituals that were pulling people in to build the city. Uh, I think storytelling was the most important one because it gave meaning to all the other rituals that they were doing. Mm -hmm. So that's what my current research is about. Now, just to follow up, can can you say how you get at the stories that were told? A the iconography, years ago? we can see the images. For example, you know, we see as uh, maybe the foundational story of Cahokia is a story about a, a great hero wearing human head earrings, mm -hmm. and there was a story told by the Ho Chunk Indians to the cultural anthropologist Paul Radin around 100 years ago about he, uh, a character named Redhorn, or he who wears human heads as earrings. And uh, a few, uh, around that same time, the Iowa Indians told a story about a great hero wearing human head earrings to the, uh, another cultural anthropologist, Alan Skinnerson. So, um, uh, yeah, we can, we, the stories obviously have changed over a thousand years. The Ho-Chunk version was different from the Iowa version. Um, but we can we can uh, we can get at some of those stories uh, through connection with known Native American stories, um, and other other you know they're, they're clearly recurring characters. Uh, for example, in the southeast, they see this moth creature, they, and they've they've nicknamed it Mothra after the <laughs> Godzilla monster because there's clearly a, some kind of moth character that was important. Uh, they don't you know we can't connect it to a known Native American story, but you can see it as like yeah. a recurring character in the imagery. So yeah. Okay, well that's that's really really fascinating. Thank you for sharing that uh, sharing that with us. And Dr. Fields, what's your research focus, and what's your what are you working on right, right now? Right now, I'm finishing up my third of three books that I've been writing collaboratively with Coast Salish elders. Two of those were with Pauline Hilaire, a totem pole history about her father's work, and a book called Rights Remembered, a Salish grandmother speaks on American Indian history and the future. And the, the third book is with Mr. Johnny Moses, whom I mentioned earlier I had met at the University of Hawaii uh, when we were looking at some of the similarities between the Polynesian people and the Northwest Coast Indian people, both of whom have a uh, ocean-based culture and great canoe culture and uh, really outstanding oral tradition and uh, civilization with all its components. He and I recorded here at, at SIUE in this building in our music department uh, in 1996. We had a, a week-long session to which we invited the public and members of the campus community. And he just spoke for uh, four days, for several hours each day, and we made audio and video recordings. I wasn't sure what I would do with them at that time, uh, and then our, our lives continued on with many other wonderful projects over the decades, and I had the opportunity to build my knowledge base and my relationships with uh, colleagues and with Native people in various places of the nation and Canada. And I'm, I'm really happy to say that this summer, after uh, how many years is that, 1996 until 2022? It's some 20, 26. 26 years. It's a quarter of a century I've been working on this book. And what it contains, uh, the title of the book is Sacred Breath, Pacific Northwest Coast Medicine Teachings, Stories, and Epics. And Johnny's been giving teachings for um, decades. He's 60 years old now, and he started his career as a memorizer at about age five when the grandparents recognized his tremendous memory and quite often will adopt the eldest grandchild for a full-time, lifetime career as a culture bearer, a healer, a memorizer, a storyteller. And so many persons, including myself, have been recording him in ceremonies and public addresses 
sometimes uh, in a studio setting, but often in the field. And there are thousands of hours of mostly audio tape and some video. And even our great radio station here at SIUE has helped me with some of the um, technical aspects of recovering and restoring some of these recordings. And of course, in the music department, uh, Dr. Rick Hayden, uh, our uh, renowned music and guitar professor, was our audio engineer to make that possible in my very first year on the faculty. And so now I've edited um, from 30 years of Moses's teachings and those of his elder relatives um, about a 400-page book that's divided into organized chapters that give you the basis of the tradition in its, its history and its philosophy and its practices of healing. And the healing has a lot to do with healing ourselves, with healing our own psychology, uh, acknowledging that in any culture and time, people carry uh, generational wounds from their their families, from the oppression that may have been placed on them by dominant cultures, from the the challenges of being a human being. And so this tradition teaches about how we can uh, manage our emotions and draw upon the, the strength of, of nature and the spirit and our, our sisters and brothers in the human world to, um, to have a, a good and happy life, a healthy life, a, an environmentally uh, sound life in respect of both the natural world and the human world. So I've written uh, introductions to these, uh, the sections of the book, and those cover a range of subjects, as Julie, my colleague here, spoke about. Stories are so important. I, I saw when uh, people were confined initially by the COVID pandemic, the Netflix subscriptions went up. People need stories, wh whether they're children or elders. Um, I know my wife and I love to watch Netflix in the evening and follow certain stories that we enjoy. And why is it that human beings enjoy stories so much? And many of the stories are, are not uh, fact-based. Uh, they're, they're fictional stories, and yet they compel us greatly. And there are a lot of reasons for this um, that I think indigenous people understood uh, related to coming to understand other minds. We can vicariously experience things through stories that we would never experience in our real life, and this helps prepare us for the experiences that we have. And that's one adaptive drive. It's, I believe, a biological drive that makes us interested in stories. So the book is about stories, but not just stories. Um, it's about psychology, it's about nature, it's about history, it's about healing. And stories are a medium of many of these teachings. So that book will be out from University of Nebraska Press um, in a year or so, and it'll be accompanied by uh, some audio CDs, possibly some video, as I did with each of the prior books. And that's a wonderful way with Native Studies to give an opportunity to hear and see the storyteller uh, or the culture bearer. It's no substitute for being in the presence of the person mm -hmm. or participating in the ceremony. It's no substitute for singing and dancing the epics as they do in the Northwest, as many ancient cultures have done and continue to do. But um, I think text is a wonderful way to, um, to, to record and preserve these teachings. Um, we hope to to help young Native people in the future. I know Johnny and his family are very concerned about the destruction of traditional knowledge um, in e even in our, our lifetimes. And, uh, and so they have hopes that this material will, will help members of their tribal cultures as well as people throughout the nation and the world who want to know about um, Native philosophy and life. I want to mention one other project I'm working on. I'll be a little briefer on this one. Um, last fall, our Native Studies program sponsored a, in, an interinstitutional conference um, under the leadership mainly of myself and Dr. Ed Spivak, who is a curator at the St. Louis Zoo. And we had participating with us, um, we had six regional institutions who each sponsored uh, native specialists in 
environmental studies, indigenous um, knowledge, and sustainability. And we had a very successful online and uh, hybrid conference with people participating live in small groups with participants from across the country and the world. And uh, we hope to repeat that um, every two years going forward. I think that's a, a really important project for our, our campus and our region to utilize the great resources we have in Native Studies to work on issues related to climate change, food insecurity, and so forth. Yeah, and that was a great, great, uh, great conference. And thank you so much for your work in, in putting that together. I was very pleased to be able to, to uh, attend some of those sessions. We appreciate so. it. Now, in the introduction, I mentioned the SIUE Land Acknowledgement Statement and how both of today's guests helped develop it. Each of the campuses within the SIU system adopted a statement to recognize and honor the original inhabitants of the lands upon which each campus is located. These statements are action-oriented, and they reflect a collective commitment to building relationships with and supporting indigenous communities. The statement is intended to be read before events, lectures, and ceremonies, and SIUE's statement is this. Southern Illinois University Edwardsville exists in and serves a region that includes the lands of the Ki Kapoi Treaty in Edwardsville, 1819, the Illinois Confederacy, including the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Michigamia, Cahokia, and Tamaroa Treaty in Edwardsville, 1818, Dejiha Suan peoples, and others. We affirm their contemporary and ancestral ties to the land and their contributions to this place. In alignment with the academic mission of the institution, we are committed to building responsible relationships with indigenous communities through the development of educational pathways and opportunities for indigenous students and the advancement of research and knowledge about indigenous peoples, cultures, and histories. Dr. Zimmerman, can you tell our audience a little about, about this statement and what it means? Um, yeah, uh, so it, you know, institutions have been talking about uh, creating land acknowledgement statements just for the last few years, and it, uh, the, the discussion has evolved in that time. Um, we want to acknowledge the people who are here uh, traditionally in this land. For me as an archaeologist, this is a really difficult question because I, do we take it back a thousand years, <laughs> 10,000 years? So if you look at the statement that we ended up with here, um, we're naming uh, the Kickapoo and Illini Confederacy because there are uh, historic treaties with them in 1819 and 1818, respectively. But uh, I, in particular, wanted to include the Dejia Suan peoples because uh, I mentioned that Cahokia is multi-ethnic, but the primary architects are believed to have been groups like the Osage uh, and other Dejia Suan peoples. So that's why we wanted to include those, and we wanted to focus on people with whom we would hope to en actually engage. Um, not just a listing a, a bunch of people, but people, uh, tribes that we're actually working with. So, for example, Monday and Tuesday this week, I was supposed to be out uh, in Kansas with the Kukapu tribe of Kansas to college and career fair, but unfortunately they had to postpone that because of some deaths in the community. Um, mm. I want to emphasize that, uh, that uh, Dr. Jessica Harris and um, our uh, provost office came, and I think the... SIU system came up with the second, the end of the statement, which is the action statement that you mentioned. So let me repeat that. It says, in alignment with the academic mission of the institution, we are committed to building responsible relationships with indigenous communities through the development of educational pathways and opportunities for indigenous students and the advancement of research and knowledge about indigenous peoples, cultures, and histories. So um, we want that to be you know, at this point, I'm gonna I'm gonna say we haven't made good progress on actually attracting indigenous students to the, to SIUE. There aren't too many, and I think the first thing that we need to do to bring them here is to have Native American faculty. Uh, at this point in our Native American Studies program, we are all white, and could you imagine a Black Studies program with no Black faculty or a Women's Studies program with no women faculty? So uh, Dr. Harris sent out an email uh, when she announced the land acknowledgement statement a few months ago in which she identified some of the initiatives that we're already working on, such as care for Native American culture items in accordance with NAGPRA or um, Native American Heritage Month programs. And Greg talked about the Indigenous Knowledge and Sustainability Conference. We've been bringing Native American Studies program has 
beg, borrow, and stolen money to bring Native American <laughs> guests here every year uh, until COVID. But for the, we had a good 10-year record there before COVID hit. And uh, But what we really need, if we want to attract Native American students, we have to have Native American faculty here. And so uh, I see the statement from our administration uh, as a promise. At this point, we have not made good on that promise. <laughs> but I'm always an optimistic person, and I hope that we will make good on that pro pro uh, promise, um, first by hiring uh, Native American faculty, and that will attract Native American students. Great. Thank you. Um, Dr. Fields, can you talk a little bit about the process by which this this statement was developed? Sure. Several of us giving conference presentations in the last few years have been called upon to give a land acknowledgement, and we didn't have one until recently. It mm -hmm. was our colleague uh, Carol Colanino Mink, 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 Meeks in the STEM program, who an archaeologist who initially approached Native Studies and said, do we have a land acknowledgement? Can you produce one? And so we went to work on doing that. And as Julie mentioned, it, it was quite an exercise in determining what Native people had been here and what their connections were with the land and, and how we would um, acknowledge them in this statement. We used sources um, including Go the government documents, of course, that have uh, the treaties in detail. Um, there are a number of geographical sources that we used in order to track um, the, the historical existence and movement of peoples through our land here. And um, various secondary sources like the uh, Smithsonian Institution's Handbook of the American Indian, which gives us the uh, reliable information from uh, specialists who've done their field work and uh, and know about the the history and present conditions of these tribal nations and so we uh, we did our our research and we conferred about the purpose of the land acknowledgement and that entailed um, at least in my case, looking at a lot of land acknowledgments across the nation and the commentary that the Native people who had written them uh, gave to accompany those statements and advice they gave to people like us who wanted to get this right. One of those things, to give an example, is that um, there's sometimes an assumption, a uh, well-meaning assumption on the part of uh, an institution or organization that a native person should be asked to give the land acknowledgement. Uh, my colleague at the Buder Center advised me about this. She said, be, be careful about that. Um, it, it can come off not uh, as respectful as, as one needs to be to turn to people and say, here, do some extra work. Uh, you know, to help us fulfill an obligation. The idea of it is um, partly that we who work at these institutions who, who may not be Native are, are making an effort to educate ourselves and to share that knowledge with our, our colleagues and our constituents. And it's not a ceremony either. It's a, a land acknowledgement, um, and sometimes, as in our case at SIU, is a statement of our commitment. Well, well, thank you so much. Uh, and that's uh, that's it, it is actually really important to me as I prepare. For example, in uh, in a, in in August, we will have the the College of Arts and Sciences fall meeting, and I look forward to, to being able to begin that meeting with the reading of the land acknowledgement statement, because it is, to me, it's really important f for us to acknowledge the, the uh, ancestral, uh, the, the fact that we are on the ancestral land of, of indigenous people, and we have an obligation as people who are on that land to, uh, to acknowledge uh, the history of the land and the and the ongoing experiences of indigenous people in our region and in our in our nation and and I look forward to to working with both of you as we as we move forward to try to strengthen Native American studies and uh, and really uh, make the land acknowledgement statement part of who we are and, and put it into operation as we build those pathways that it refers to. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Julie Zimmerman and Dr. Greg Fields, for talking with us about your experiences 
your research, and the SIUE land acknowledgement statement. I look forward to further conversations with you both about your, your research and your work. And for our listeners, thank you so, so much for joining us. Stay safe and take care. Okay, perfect. We are out. Thank you.